Hello, this is Rob Pike, returning for part seven of the series, The Lie of Eternal Torment, but the Truth of God's Love. All of us who have studied the Bible know that God chose a nation of Israel to be his chosen nation. But all throughout the Old Testament, we see that over and over again, they rebelled against God and he would punish them, even to the point of completely leveling and destroying the entire city of Jerusalem in the year 586 B.C. What was the motive behind the punishment from God in these cases? Was it purely for revenge on them for their disobedience? Or was it corrective in nature? And if it was just because he wanted to get vengeance upon them for their sins, why did he continue to show favor to them to the point of sending his son to the earth to die for them? Let's talk about that. There is actually no question about the reason God kept punishing his chosen nation and Israel for their sins. Just think about this for a moment. Regardless of the miracles that God did for this nation, God never gave up on them, but continued to punish them over and over with one thought in mind, and that was to reconcile them to himself. Now, we're not speaking of some small failures on the part of Israel. After centuries of forgiveness, reconciliation, and disobedience again, this nation became an abomination to God that was so bad that God told his prophet Jeremiah three times not to pray for them anymore. The worst of the worst of these was an evil king named Manasseh. And what is probably the most horrible thing that Manasseh did? He sacrificed his own son to the fire of the false god Molech. He practiced sorcery, divination, and witchcraft, all of which are specifically condemned by God. So God brought in the Assyrian armies and took Manasseh prisoner. But during the midst of his severe punishment and while in deep distress, Manasseh came to his senses and sought the Lord, and God restored him to his kingship, and he lived out the rest of his life in obedience. Let's notice the account of this in 2 Chronicles 33. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. Therefore the Lord brought the upon them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manasseh with the hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Yes, the punishment here had a purpose. It was corrective in nature, and there was no question that it worked. The same is true of King Nebuchadnezzar about 40 years later, who ruled after the destruction of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar was the arrogant king of Babylon. God used him to destroy Jerusalem the first time. But God warned him of his arrogance by the mouth of the prophet Daniel, who interpreted his dream. He told the king that if he did not repent of his evil, that he would be driven to the fields to eat grass like a beast for a period of seven years. But what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He completely ignored Daniel's words and continued in his extreme arrogance. The entire account can be found in Daniel chapter 4, but notice what happened to him according to the records that Daniel wrote. At the end of twelve months he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. Yes, the judgment was about to befall this most arrogant king exactly as prophesied by Daniel. It says, continuing in Daniel 4.33, Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. Yes, it came true exactly as prophesied. Nebuchadnezzar was a madman for seven years, eating the grass of the field like a beast. But what was the result of this judgment? 
the account tells us at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the hosts of the heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Daniel 4, 34-37 do you see the powerful message of this fulfilled prophecy? Here is an exact picture of what the prophet Isaiah proclaimed. Did God have to twist Nebuchadnezzar's arm to get him to bow and confess that he was Lord? No. The punishment was corrective. It worked exactly as it was intended. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar went through hell for a period of seven years, and it was corrective punishment, which changed him completely from, from an arrogant unbeliever to a humble believer, praising God to the fullest. What a beautiful picture of reconciliation on the part of a loving and just God. So now as we re return to the verse in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, once again we see, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yes, there's no question that this will be played out in the afterlife because it's obvious that it has not been fulfilled on this earth. What I would like to do now is to ask you to put your thinking cap on. Together we will examine three scenarios for you to rationally consider, considering what we have discussed up to this point. I ask you to honestly use your reasoning to look at this passage in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, and how it would be played out in the judgment according to the most prominent interpretations of what happens to the lost at the judgment. Although we know that God's ways are higher than our ways, we are created in the image of God and we should reasonably be able to discern the following. Scenario number one deals with by far the most prominent view of the church today, perhaps because of a mistaken understanding of Matthew 25, 41 through 46, which we have discussed in past videos. But I will remind you that the punishment spoken of in this passage is kolassus, which is the Greek word meaning corrective punishment. It is not the Greek word timoria or timorio, meaning vengeance or retribution. So with this in mind, let's look at these scenarios. The first scenario is uh, the lost are condemned to eternal torment in Gehenna. Most likely, the confession of Jesus Christ as Lord is forced. The result, eternal, never-ending torment, which go on, goes on throughout all the eons of time with no purpose. I ask you sincerely, where is the love in that? Does this sound like a God whose mandate in the Old Testament was that the punishment must fit the crime? Let's go to scenario number two. Under this scenario, the lost are annihilated. The lost person immediately upon his physical death goes to the judgment, but once again, whether they willing can, willingly confess or not, their future is already determined and the Lord condemns them to eternal destruction. They completely cease to exist, but then the problem is, unless the judgment occurred while they were dead, this means that they would die twice, thus completely negating the passage at Hebrews 9.27. Now let's look at scenario number three. The lost are punished with a view to reconciliation. The lost person immediately upon his physical death goes to the judgment. Sentence is pronounced and he is immediately sent to the corrective Colossus Greek punishment. The punishment will be like a refiner's fire which burns off the impurities as spoken of in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. And the sinner is reconciled by the blood of Christ and willingly and with heartfelt conviction humbly bows before the Lord and confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
Under this scenario, there's no forced confession. There is no question that the, that the now reconciled believer honestly believes with total conviction that Jesus is Lord. He also knows that because of his work on the cross and the result, and he also knows that because of his work at the cross, and the result is that this will bring glory to God. I'd like to read something to you from Thomas Talbot, and he nails it when he points out a quote from J.B. Lightfoot concerning this passage in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. He says, when Paul suggested that every tongue would come to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, he chose a verb that throughout the Septuagint implies not only confession, but the offer of praise and thanksgiving as well. And furthermore, as J.B. Lightfoot once pointed out, such implications of praise exist in the very passage of Isaiah 45, 23, which St. Paul adapts, now a ruling monarch may indeed force a subject to bow against that subject's will, may even force that subject to utter certain words. But praise and thanksgiving can only come from the heart, as the Apostle Paul was no doubt clear-headed enough to discern. In any case, those who bow before Jesus Christ and declare openly that he is Lord either do so sincerely and by their own choice, or they do not. If they do so sincerely and by their own choice, then there can be but one reason. They, too, have been reconciled to God. And if they do not do so sincerely by their own choice, if they are instead forced to make obeisance against their will, then their actions are merely a fraudulent action and bring no glory to God. A Hitler may take pleasure in forcing his defeated enemies to make obeisance against their will, but God who honors the truth could not possibly participate in such a fraud. Yes, the prophet Isaiah long ago attested to the mercy of God. He is more merciful than we are and always consistent with his love. Notice the words of the prophet. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Do you see the significant power of this passage? Yes, God will have compassion on the wicked who return to him. But the point of this passage is often missed. When it says, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, it is saying that God has much more compassion than we inferior humans can conceive. Notice how this thought is finished in this passage that the prophet Isaiah writes under the inspiration of God. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent from Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. God is stating without any question that whatever he wills is going to be accomplished. So now with all of this in mind, what do you think? Under scenario three, all of the qualities of Jesus and the prophets spoke of are in complete harmony. What about scenario one and scenario number two, which is eternal torment or eternal destruction? Can you honestly say in your heart that these first two scenarios conform to what is spoken of concerning our Lord above? Will he send them to a place of eternal torment where they will be tormented endlessly throughout the eons of time with no chance of reconciliation? Or will he kill them a second time and void his words from Hebrews 9.27? Or does he reconcile him to himself as spoken of in the following passage? For it was the Father's gracious will that the whole of the divine perfection should dwell in him. And God purposed through him to reconcile the universe to himself, making peace through his blood, which was shed upon the cross to reconcile to himself through him. I say, things on earth and things in heaven. This is Colossians 1, 19-20 from the Weymouth Testament. 
So I'd like to ask you at this time, do you have any regrets in this life? Does anything that you have done in your past seem to haunt you every day? Perhaps a consistent reminder of you of the irreversible sin that you have committed. How many tears have you shed over this action? But you know that you are absolutely powerless to change what has happened in, in your past. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. But I believe that since someday all things will be reconciled to God, you will be able to right that wrong you have committed. Women who have aborted babies and have shed so many tears of anguish over that life that has been lost will once again see that child and rejoice. Those who are in prison for taking a life, whether by murder, manslaughter, or drunk driving, will one day get to apologize to that person. Those who have had broken marriages due to their own shortcomings will be restored into a loving relationship with that family they have forsaken. And those who have abused their children, creating a lifelong rift, will one day be reconciled to them. Perhaps this is the way it will be with those who have rejected Christ and will have to suffer in Gehenna for a time as justified by our great Savior. Perhaps the purging fire, whatever form it will be, will create a, dense, a deep sense of sorrow in the hearts of those undergoing its cleansing effect so that in the end they are crying out to God and praising Him as the Lord and Savior of the universe. Oh, what a glorious time that will be. Once again, we see why Paul broke out in praise to God at the end of Romans chapter 11, as he finished stating that even after their rejection of the Christ, they too would be reconciled to God. Notice what he said. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. From Romans 11, 33-36. Our Paul is praising God for a reason. It is because of his love. It's because of his justice. And because of his wisdom and mercy. And we can likewise praise him. When we come back in our next session, we will examine why it is that some people in the Bible seem to have been unfairly targeted by God, and what is the solution for this, which, which also equates to God's perfect love. So until the next time, I'd like to say thank you for watching, and God bless.